Welcome to another episode of the Performance Psychology Podcast. In today's episode, I'm interviewing Mark Cheney, who is the Director of Mental Performance at the Faith Lutheran High School in Las Vegas, Nevada. Today's episode, we discuss how the youth of today, the challenges that they face in trying to play golf and the competitions for their attention, how best we can prepare for rounds of golf and the destructive things that we tend to get into before we go and play. So sit back and relax and enjoy the conversation. So I'm delighted to introduce Mark Cheney to the Performance Psychology Podcast. Thanks so much for coming on, Mark. Thanks for having me, Trevor. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this conversation, given the area that you work in. But uh, would you mind just telling us a little bit about your background and what brought you into performance psychology? So I have over 20 years of experience teaching and coaching at the high school level. And in the course of, of that experience, I've, I've constantly been looking for ways to help my athletes perform better and uh, ran into some instances where I'd used everything in my, my toolbox and still wasn't working for those athletes. So I went back to school, I've got a degree in performance psychology and, and then also was certified as a mental performance consultant. And now I work with the teams of my school as the director of mental performance. I teach a performance and sports psychology class to some of those students as well. And, and then I consult with um, some university athletic teams and individuals who are looking to get better at what they love to do. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, area to work in. I mean, I've, I've got a few uh, kind of high performing adolescents myself. And what's, what's particularly interesting is the, the contrast maybe of how how much do you work with them typically on a one-to-one -one basis as opposed to them being together as a group? Yeah, it, it really varies on, on the team and the context. So I, I still coach a golf team. And in, in that setting, then it, it's certainly group application if we're talking about a concept, but then uh, more informal work of walking down the fairway or standing by the green or, or having a discussion on the practice tee and, as opposed to a more formal session of sitting down for a conversation. If it's, it's an individual that, that's wanting to work with me, then, then we do get into that more formal, sit down, have that conversation for 45 minutes to an hour. So really depends on their needs and, and the group I'm working with. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, you know, you've got kind of a, an age group there that pretty much, you know, can learn things incredibly quickly. Um, but in the same breath, as we know, having all been there ourselves, um, you know, mentally, there are some challenges there. Uh, so I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about the, you know, the, the psychology uh, and the approach that you take with, with this age group. How do you help them to step up to the challenges that they face kind of mentally, either on um, you know, we're like in the off season and, and trying to practice to, to work on parts of their game for the next season or specifically in the moment of performance itself. Yeah, I, th I think with, with this generation in particular, so um, we're talking Generation Z, really, and one of the challenges I see for them is, is really being present and, and being aware uh, you know, for their entire lives, they've had some type of stimulus. And going back to when they were toddlers, preschoolers, parents maybe handing them an iPad to entertain them as opposed to handing them a book. And up through elementary school and now even their academic experience, we hand them an iPad or we hand them a, a laptop as part of their, their learning experience. And Outside of that, they've grown up with the smartphone. And, and so they're constantly plugged in, um, constantly have an earbud in or an AirPod in their ears. And, and I find there's very little time when they're just alone with their thoughts. In fact, the only time that that actually happens, I think, is when they're on the golf course or when they're in the, the performance domain. And, and so now, they don't know what to do with that. 
and, and whether it's the chatter that arises or the fear of evaluation, uh, fear of other people's opinions, their playing partners, their teammates, their opponents, that becomes a, a significant distraction. And they haven't grown up with that awareness of, of what their thoughts are, what's effective. And, and they don't really handle that as well as, as perhaps older generations that didn't have that constant stimulus and had more time to just sit and think and, and notice what was happening. So I, I think that's a real challenge. And that's where I, I typically start of just helping them recognize what are they saying to themselves or what are their tendencies or, or even understanding that some of their physiological responses are normal, that this is part of being human and not that you're, you're broken. You don't need to be fixed, but you're having a normal physiological and psychological response, but let's understand what's behind that. And then how we can modulate that to help us perform better. Are there any, uh, I mean, I, I'm absolutely with you on that, you know, having, having two kind of youngish kids myself and, and, and trying to, um, you know, balance, I suppose, you know, the use of screens and, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes distraction is an okay thing uh, in the right context, but I absolutely am with you 100%. There's, you know, there are these attentional um, difficulties that actually we really didn't have to face. And that's uh, you know that that's a hard thing. Um, do you have any do you have any formal practices that you use to kind of help them? Um, given that you know, I suppose attention really is going to be that much more challenging for them in mm -hmm. the the way that they've you know been brought up. Are there any formal practices that you tend to go to 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 help them with more attentional flexibility? So uh, you know, certainly. Um, like I mentioned, I, we want them to be aware, to notice what's happening. And, and so I'll give you an example of that. Uh, if I take an athlete and, and in a conversation we've had, we see, seem to hear that, that their inner dialogue, that, that self-talk is not as productive as it could be. Um, I'll, just, I'll give them a rubber band and say, all right, put this on your wrist. And every time you say something that's that's negative, critical, unhelpful to your performance, give yourself a snap and, and wear that and then come back to me and I'll, I'll see you in a week. And, and hopefully that rubber band is not broken. And, <laughs> you know, because I have had kids come back and say, I'm sorry, I broke my rubber band. But <laughs> even in that instance, um, they've now started to notice just how frequently they engage in a conversation with themselves that, that's less than helpful. And, and so that would be a, a very concrete action that, that we would take. Um, so they've got this one, very simple um, kind of attentional anchor, as it were, just, just to notice when they're really starting to engage in some quite unhealthy uh, self-talk, like right. in, internally. So yeah, they kind so of, they'll, 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 hear the, they'll hear the kind of negative self-talk and, um, they'll be engaging in that kind of back and forth conversation. And what you're saying is as soon as they notice that they're kind of off in their heads with this back and forth, then they snap the band. That kind of recenters them. But what do you encourage them to do from there? Or is, it, or is that just an exercise for just noticing for the sake of, you know, giving them an attentional anchor? Right. Initially, it's, it's just the noticing of, yeah. of starting to tune into that. And then... Then we can transition from there of how can we redirect that? Um, you know, and I, and I take a, a two-prong approach to it of one of just, of just that noticing. And, and what I like to talk to them about is, is the idea of if your brain is constantly pumping out thoughts and emotions and you can't stop that from happening, um, but you can choose to focus on those things. So if, that negative thought comes up, whether it's, I shanked it in the water on this hole last time we played it, or I took three putts to get down from this spot on the green two days ago, or, or what's going on, or, or even on, on the, the positive side of, I can't wait to tell my teammates what I shot today and mm -hmm. getting ahead of themselves. of so just noticing that and, and getting themselves 
to a point where they could say, okay, there's the thought. Just recognize, okay, I'm having a thought. Now, do you choose to dwell on it or not? That you can control. So if you choose to chase it and follow that thought and dwell on it and, and let it manifest and grow, then, then that's on you. But you can't stop the initial thought. And I, I think that's helpful just from their perspective as well to realize, okay, thoughts are going to happen, but if I just become aware of them, they're probably going to pass on. So, so that, that's one angle I take. The other that I like to talk about is if they feel like I can't let it go. I'm, I'm dwelling on it more than I want to and allowing it to, to pass by is, is still a struggle. Now we can talk about some more uh, behavioral approaches of question the thought, use some logic and say, wait, is that really right? Do you really shake it every time you play this hole? Do you really three putt? Are you a terrible golfer? And and use some logic in, in those and provide some some the, evidence. The, the, the idea there is to just take some energy from it, just to try and take some of its kind of believability away. Yeah, and and question and I, I think I think what I see a lot with um, this generation, even my own kids, I have two teenagers, is is some very black and white thinking. It, mm. it's either or it's and, and so it's either none of the time or all of the time absolute thinking and when they engage in that and that's not accurate it, it's not realistic to say i always do this or i never do this so so let's realize that there is a spectrum of performance there's a, a spectrum of of behavior and, and so let's start to shift that and now, being aware of it and and thinking a little more logically and, and realistically about what's happening. I just thought actually of um, kind of possibly a metaphor very much in line with uh, just what you were saying about just, just kind of questioning it and like, you know, is that really kind of believable? And I suppose I was just thinking about this age group and I certainly remember maybe I indulged a little bit in myself at that time, but I think around that age, you always get kind of friends that are prone to exaggeration. You know, you're kind of, yes. and you'll always have those one or two friends. And I suppose you eventually learn kind of with, you know, as, as time goes on, you kind of learn to start to take what they say, you know, at face value and, and, um, and you're just like, yeah, okay. You know, and they start going, oh, and I did this and, I did and it's kind of like, so maybe that, maybe that's a kind of interesting way that I, I just had a thought of, maybe that's a useful way of, uh, you know, relaying it to them about the, the black and white thinking but um, yeah that's I mean those are two very very powerful as you said the, the start with the, the noticing itself is just such a powerful exercise this the kind of automated response this habitual um, and particularly for, as you said for this this generation is is such a challenge for them um, yeah that, that's a that's a really interesting insight thanks the so is, is that a particular model it, in itself, or are you kind of drawing together different aspects? Yeah, I would say it, in terms of a, like a theoretical background, yes, I, you know, I'm, I'm pulling some, some mindfulness there. I'm, I'm pulling some cognitive behavioral approaches and, and I, I come from a very applied perspective and particularly with my age group, the last thing they want to hear is theory. Actually, most people that talk to me, they don't want to hear uh, the academic jargon. And so, so I try to avoid using that. Like, and so we may use a, an approach that's certainly talking about their motivation and it's self-determination theory, but I'm not using that, that terminology. Or we may talk about uh, activation management, but you know, there, there's, that academic side, the research side that I really try to keep out of it. And so, you know, what, what I know mostly athletes want to know is, can you help me? Yeah. And, and what are some tools? And, and so I try to, you know, and a lot of it's just trial and error of things that I've used in my coaching and things I've used with individuals. Fine. I like this approach. Let's, this resonates. And, and so that's, um, 
I suppose some of it comes from my teacher background too, of, you know, master thief. And I, I beg, borrow, steal ideas and concepts from anywhere that I find that's effective. Yeah, I suppose it, it really comes down to uh, what works at the end of the day, doesn't it? What's, yes. what's useful and what's functional. Um, so, so that being said, when, when you get them into a, a kind of a team dynamic, is there a, is there kind of like a, a bringing together of all of these um, kind of issues and uh, like attentional problems and so on and so forth? Do you, we do that in a group setting as well? You know, we, we can certainly, well, so I'll use an example. If I'm working with a team, one thing, if, especially if it's not my team. So then very much I'm in conversation with the coach as well as observing practices, observing performances and identifying what, what are our targets and, and what are we looking to, to focus on. And so what I do find in, in my work with teams then it tends to be more on the side of um, team cohesion, team culture, and then when, but we also address attention, motivation, use of mental skills. And, and so that can be a bit more on the educational side because I'm presenting the concept to a group of individuals. And then out of that, we may have some individual conversations afterwards. So, um, it, I really craft it to what, what the coaches need, what the athletes need, and, and take that, uh, that approach to it. But I, I do find with, with teams, it seems like coaches want to spend more time talking about culture and coachability and, and resilience as a group. Can you see at all um, it, in terms of when you're, you know, when you're working with teams that aren't your own and you've kind of been brought in, I suppose, specifically for the mental performance side of things. Are there any, um, are there any common kind of issues at all when you're going in there that, you know, maybe the coaches are, are getting slightly off point and they're, and they're bringing you in. Is that the kind of common things that you're facing there? Um, I, th I think one and one is certainly preparation for, for practice. And, and having a, a systematic approach to practice that, that then also transfers to competition. So again, use, using the high school or collegiate athlete age bracket, their, their typical approach to practice is to use, use the day to set their routine. So I go to school, I go to my classes, I see my friends, I leave class, I go to practice. And that's what establishes the routine for coming to practice. And, and you know, typically their pre-practice routine it looks something like this. So I get out of class, I check my phone, I go talk to my friends, I look at the clock, realize I'm going to be late and coach is going to make us run if we're late. I'm gonna to run to the gym, throw on my my practice gear or a kit or change clothes or get to the golf course or wherever they're going. And hopefully I'm arriving on time or at least within a minute or before one of my other teammates. So I'm not the last one there. Okay. Let's practice. And so there, there's no, no real approach or idea of what's, what am I trying to accomplish today? It's all quite, re it's all feels quite reactive. Yes. And now if you remove the school day, you've now removed the, what is their default routine. And so then you see a very poor practice, a very poor competition, because what, what little bit of routine they had in preparing for practice and competition is now gone as well. And, and so our, our coaches have definitely seen, and I've seen with my own teams on days when there is no school, or a half day of school or a change in schedule or routine of the day, then that translates into practice. So I spend a lot of time talking about, okay, leave practice and then start, let's prepare for practice. So spend some time breathing, noticing your breath, intentionally focusing 
your attention on, on your breathing. Establish a, a clear goal for what am I trying to accomplish today? And, and very much a process oriented goal of when I go to practice today, I want to accomplish X, Y, Z. Now spend some time mentally rehearsing the goal prior to stepping foot on the course pitch floor. And then once we're in practice, let's manage the self-talk that arises as we're going through practice. So having a, an intentional approach to something I'm trying to accomplish going through practice and then likewise in competition. And then at the close of practice, your first move isn't check your phone or go get something to eat. It's to reflect on the day and say, did I accomplish my goal? What went well today? What didn't go well today? How am I going to change that tomorrow? What am I going to do differently? And then also what did I learn? What did I enjoy about the day? And so having a, a systematic um, routine at the start of practice as well as at the close of practice, and then using that same approach in competition so that we have that consistency um, in preparation and performance. I mean, that, uh, as you described, the, uh, you know, the high school student and that fairly scatty, reactive kind of routine before practice, I was just thinking about, you know, how many, how many guys are going to the driving range having that exact routine coming from work? And then, you know, probably to be honest with you, when they're, when, within a few shots, they're, you know, in, in such an emotional state that actually they just want to hit the driver to just from a cathartic experience, just to kind of offload some, some stress, you know, from the day. So, you know, which is fine, you know, that's within a context and that can be useful, but um, in the same breath, it's probably in terms of skill development and, you know, working on their, whatever it is, form, function, so on and so forth, it's probably not going to be the most productive session. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to be learned from, as you suggested, just taking that few minutes before you even hit a golf ball to kind of sit down, maybe take a few notes, um, be mindful of the breath, have an attentional anchor. And even, as you said, explicitly, you're not just there to practice the physical skills. You're also talking about, you know, managing the mental skills as well. For sure. And, and I will fully admit that I've done this. I've shown up at the golf course <laughs> running later than I wanted for my tee time, pull into the parking lot, grab the clubs, trunk, uh, slam the trunk, go to the range. And, and this would, I would say, before I, I knew what I know now, but, oh, I've got to get some balls in the air. And, and so now my rhythm is off. My tempo is quicker than normal. And not surprisingly that a couple of shots don't come off the club the way I want. And then it's a very easy switch for many people to start thinking into, to fix it mode of I'm not getting myself ready. Now it's, I've got to figure out what's wrong with my swing and how can I get a ball in the air? So I'll, I don't embarrass myself on the first tee. Okay. And, do, you mind if I, do you mind if I jump in there? Cause I think there's a really interesting uh, kind of piece in there about, you know, that, that's obviously, you know, obviously it's bound to the context of the situation, but let's say that kind of guy's got uh, two young kids and he's, he's, he's just got kind of four and a half hours to be out of the house. Otherwise the wife's going to have him strung up, you know, so he is literally leaving at the last minute. He hasn't really got much choice. He can't prepare like a tour pro. He's not going to the gym for an hour and then a half an hour massage and then range for an hour. So this is kind of like a real world situation. So given kind of what you know now, what would be your, what would be your, your kind of your, your best intervention at, at that point? You know, you've only got 10, 15 minutes before you tee off and the situation of life as it is at that moment means that that's all you've got. So what, what are you suggesting is, uh, or what would, in your opinion, be the best thing to do? I, I would rather see somebody spend, spend that 10 minutes using, taking a minute, perhaps two minutes of just focused breathing, of you know, regulating their physiology and, and really getting present and then preparing their body. You know, so, so with my, my own teams, 
we have a, approximately a 10 minute physical warm up that, that we use. That, um, and I don't have the source on this any longer. I, it doesn't come to mind, but was tested on, on both the European tour and with some PGA tour players and found that just using this resulted in a couple of extra yards of distance as compared to somebody who hit balls on the range, but didn't prepare their body. Yeah. And, and so now the body is ready. The mind is more present. We're not rushing. We're not in a panic mode. And very frequently then, and I found this for myself, is that I can go to the first tee without having hit one ball, but my body's ready, my mind's ready, and I can put a good swing on the first ball. I mean, there's, I think with a lot of golfers, there's this belief that the warm up dictates how I'm going to play. Yeah. And, and so I must warm up and I must warm up well in order to play well. And, and that's not true. Um, the warm up doesn't dictate how you're going to play. We've all had those moments where we warmed up poorly and played great or warmed up great and played rubbish. But so that's not, not the key. The warm up is just to warm us up, to get us prepared. And, uh, and I, I think if we allow the automatic functioning of, of our mind to say, we know how to swing a golf club. We know how to hit golf balls. We haven't forgotten and, and allow that more instinctual part of, of our mind to take over, then it's going to function that way. So, so I found that that to be very effective for me and, and, and as well for my teams, we, we frequently will get out of class and, and early in the spring, daylight is short. There's not time for 30 to 45 minutes on the range. It, it's pretty much show up at the golf course and let's go play boys. And, and so using 10 minutes to get your mind and body ready has, has been effective for us. So is that, is that using a golf club and swinging a golf club, but not actually hitting any balls or is that kind of a structured uh, kind of stretching routine? Yeah, it's, it's not hitting any balls. Um, it is using a club for, for some of the movements and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to share that with you and send it to you. I have, a, I have a card that I've given all my players. So they they can't say they've forgotten how to do it, yeah. uh, which, is, which is an excuse I've heard before. So, so I hand that to each of them at the first day of practice and say, we will do this. Whether we're going to the range, whether we're going on the course, this needs to be done before we go out. And, and so it's, it's warming up wrists, shoulders, hips, uh, rotational motion and, and getting some, some rhythm in, in the body. Yeah. Yeah, and, there's some, yeah. and there's some accountability there. If you've given them the kind of the, the card with all the kind of exercises on them, but I, and I can absolutely, I'd really agree with you in that, you know, so often kind of, you know, turning up in that somewhat reactive state without a plan other than, uh, let's hit some shots to loosen up. And as you say, kind of you're almost judging your performance, almost predicting your performance on the day, judging on how those shots go. And now you're really on an emotional roller coaster because, um, you know, generally speaking, if you've, if you've just got out of bed and you're kind of rushing to the golf course somewhat and you haven't really done any stretching, then your golf swing isn't going to be anywhere near as best. So the first few shots of the, of the day really aren't going to be um, particularly good and if your attention is going down to playing the game of swing and I've got to fix this here and now then you're just you know loading more reaction on top of reaction um, so I'm, I'm completely with you on that that's uh, you know that's a, that's a very interesting um, you know that would be a big paradigm shift for people in terms of maybe treating warm-up as a bit more like blowing off the cobwebs just getting the body to start to move, noticing what the mind's doing, and then and then kind of going from there. As you say, there's there's maybe more trust trust in yourself, I suppose, in, in that sense. There's a bit more trust in that you won't have forgotten how to play. I, I would I would say so. And and the other thing I would say is is that that thought of I need to fix my swing or what's wrong with my swing today leads to a very internal focus. Yeah. 
And, and we know that an, an internal focus does not facilitate you know, good motor production movement or motor yeah. behavior. And, and the more external we can make that focus, um, the better we can, we can be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate. I ran across the research of, of Gabrielle Wolf, um, who, who's a professor here in Las Vegas at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And, and her research on external focus shows, you know, the further away from the body it is, the better the performance. And, and most of her research she did with golfers. In looking at so would you mind um just just for those who are listening in who, who would be familiar with uh, gabriella wolf and her research into sure. internal so, external focus could you just define yeah i think unfortunately a large part of golf instruction talks about body positions and where are your hands and where are the arms and where are the hips and where where's your focus and, and so that leads to focusing on the body and we're swinging a, an instrument that is an extension of our body. And, and so what her research has, has really indicated is that moving the focus out from the physical body. So thinking about body positions and then even to the club and not just the club, but moving that extension even further out to the club head to the club face, the more we extend or make our focus external and, and get it in that direction, the more effectively we can achieve the objective of swinging the club. So you're not, you're not focused on where your body is, you're focused on where the club is and what you're trying to, where you're trying to send the golf ball. So that, that is an external focus of, I want the ball to go here versus I want my hands to pronate at the proper time two completely different focuses and it's the, the external focus that helps us be more effective and so so our research is, has really been solid and, and cited in a number of of golf magazines golf digest golf magazine and uh yeah and trevor i'm happy to share those links with you because when i ran across it um and, and even her, she has a book that's that's very good, very approachable, and uh, made a lot of sense to me. Definitely changed how I coach. So we want to get get out of our heads and out of our bodies, and and get into playing golf, not golf swing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's uh, pretty well. Uh, I'm pretty well versed in the kind of the internal external um, debate. I mean, this I, I suppose there there are. It comes down to context, doesn't it? I mean, there are some occasions where an internal focus is okay, but as you say, in a general sense, if you were an instructor or if you were just giving someone some advice who's just about to go and play, you're, if I was a betting man, then I'd rather that advice be external than internal. Right, and, um, and I, I agree with you. I think there is that time for internal focus. And if you're going to make that the focus of a lesson or a practice session, then I would try to take the outcome out of the picture. So hitting into a net or keeping it indoors. So I'm not watching the ball flight because as soon as I see ball flight, now I'm going to be thinking about how do I get the ball flight I want rather than that position. And so that, that gets us back into making compensations and uh, relapsing into to maybe an old motor pattern and, so do you know one of one of the most interesting kind of moments in my career that's just just kind of popped to mind in in terms of you know I always describe uh, attentional processes in terms of uh, you know like a, a coal miner wearing a torch beam on their head and just think about like where that torch beam is shining mm -hmm. and of course it can be internal and it can be on thoughts and it can be on you know five cents five senses kind of things. Um, it can be on the butterflies in our stomach and so on. So, you know, we're pretty poor at um, what I'd call torch beam skills, you know, this ability to move attention around. And just my kind of little story on when I kind of caught it, you know, I, I caught the process of attention kind of in flight as it happened was, you know, for years and years and years, I tried to work on lag in my golf swing. You know, that's like kind of holy grail type stuff for, for, for a lot of players. 
Um, although again, it's kind of on reflection, I wonder whether I was actually chasing the right thing. But, you know, in practice swings, as I film myself, you know, I'd lag like Sergio Garcia <laughs> or kind of Ben Hogan. It would be like off my right shoulder as a right-hand player and then put the ball in the way and it would all just disappear. And I, I, for years and years, I just couldn't understand what was going on. And then I just caught it and I can kind of bring it to my now and just remember, I just caught that my torch beam had shifted. Obviously, I didn't use that language. I didn't have that language available to me at that time, that metaphor. But I just caught that actually when I was over the golf ball, my torch beam had moved to a completely different place. So no wonder that the movement had changed. So really interesting in terms of, you know, having a having a, a practice and a warm up that's kind of more like, I suppose, true to the, the terminology there as, as a warming up of, you know, flexibility and of the muscles and tendons and so on and so forth the proprioception you know that awareness of kind of where things are in balance I think you know now my routine personally is very much in line with what you say so you know before I go and play a tournament I still play some you know somewhat competitive golf before I play a tournament actually I'll I'll spend five to ten minutes um, swinging kind of somewhat with my feet together on a balance rod with my eyes closed and I'll be wearing this kind of, um, it's a gravity fit device, which is kind of this rubber tubing that makes it kind of difficult to, to yeah. kind of retain good positions. And I'll, I'll just do that and brush the ground, you know, at full speed for kind of five or 10 minutes and not even hit a ball just to kind of get that. I'd, I almost say it's like a, a shot of an espresso for, a, for that, that system. Um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I think there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot people can take from that conversation around changing the focus in warming up um, or changing the goal of what a warm-up could be. Yeah, that, that, was, that was wonderful. Um, do you still play at all? I do. Not, yeah. not nearly as much as I would like, but it, it's somewhat the, uh, if you want to play golf, sell insurance. If you don't want to <laughs> play golf, go into the golf business. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I do. Have you found have you found that um, you know all of your work within you know mental performance? Uh, have you found that that's helped your own game at all? I, I do, and, and I would say too, uh, since I don't play as much as, as I may have five ten years ago, I'm still able to shoot similar scores despite a less time practicing and and less time playing and i think that's because of how i've changed my preparation for when i go to play how i manage my expectations and um and just noticing what what i'm doing on the golf course so so it, it certainly has has made that difference and uh when my own kids are out of high school then i'm anticipating i'll be playing more golf but uh but until they're they're off to college then Right now, it's the, that season where I'm not playing as much, but but it, it certainly has made a difference for me. So, just from a uh, just from a behavioural point of view, um, just coming and, and it, it, you know, I, I've I suppose just coming back to that point, I've, I've had similar experiences in that you know my improving understanding of um, you know how the mind works and and good good ways of. Um, developing skills that can help us step up to the mental challenges that the golf presents. Um, you know, my game is maybe better now than it was, you know, kind of ironically, I've finished playing now, but um, it's interesting how kind of so, so many people will say, you know, the, the real difference for me is in the psychology and in the, in the mental aspect, but yet so few are willing to, you know, invest time in, in actually working on it and maybe that's just because as you say that the academic side of things the, the literature and the and the way it's being portrayed feels maybe either too academic or, or too kind of woohoo you know it's um so finding the finding that middle path for for us um in that area is probably the probably the key i think going forward because there's a lot of great stuff in that and you and i have felt it in our own experience um just looping back in just uh, just briefly in terms of the uh, you know the, the tendency for 
you know, not just the, the, the kids on the team, but for us as well and for the guys who are trying to go out and play, you know, in a, in a weekly competition, this tendency to be, you know, this distractibility, you know, whether it's emails we have to respond to or checking of Facebook or kind of so on and so forth. Um, what's kind of the, the, the best strategy that you found in terms of, um, you know, getting your getting the people you work with away from that and into some better processes before they play. Yeah, I think in, in some aspects, there's just some discipline of I'm going to turn the phone off today or, and, and which is, is hard, especially for the nature of work right now for people that, that feel like they're constantly on call, but let, let's at least turn the notifications off so that your phone is not buzzing. You're, you're not getting that, that additional input that draws your attention elsewhere. So, you know, what are some, some concrete approaches of just reducing that, that temptation, if you will, to, uh, mm -hmm. to get distracted or to then get sucked in because as soon as that notification arrives or that email comes in or the text, then, now we have this device in our hands that can take us any number of directions. So uh, let, let's try to limit those, those notifications or even, even better, I like turning my phone off uh, so, so that I can completely get away. But uh, another, another thing that I, very simple that I use with, with all my players is uh, the acronym WIN of what's important now. And, and I've found that to be really simple and memorable for, for anyone that I've worked with is, is saying what's important now. And so that helps them really handle both the internal and the external distractions of getting ahead of themselves in their mind of I'm about to shoot a career low, or I'm about to break par for the first time or, or, I just went double, double, triple. In, in either case, it, it helps us, okay, refocus. Well, what's important now is I need to go through my routine, make a good selection on this, this shot, and then, then swing with freedom and, and good rhythm. So asking that question, if it's something external, your playing partners are having a bad day, they're throwing clubs, they're being a general distraction. Okay, well, what's important now is that I focus on this shot and, and what I'm trying to accomplish here on the golf course or, or if it's uh, even out, out off the golf course, likewise of well, what's, what's important now, what do I need to handle right now rather than what's happened or what might happen. And, uh, you know, I, I was talking to some people about this last week of the last year has made that question even more important. Everyone's focused on what's happened or what might happen in the future? Well, what's important right now? And, and so, you know, from a competitive aspect, when people focus on winning a tournament or, or winning a money match, they tend not to win the money match. But if they focus on what's important now and that version of win, then, then they're more likely to get the win they want as well. Yeah, yeah. It's a very, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, I've done these kind of very simple um, you know, acronyms that kind of stick in the mind. Uh, I mean, that, that's, it's just so, what I really got a sense from is, is kind of the very grounding nature. You know, it's just, it's very much, it's just here now, you know, and, and then getting the attention up. Okay, so where do I want to go with this? Exactly. So, yeah, it's fantastic. I'll be, um, I'll certainly be using that one. That's, uh, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, Mark, look, it's been a, absolute pleasure talking to you today i'm sure people are really going to benefit from this conversation and, and maybe start to question a little bit more about how they um you know those attentional processes internal external or even uh just the, the volume of distractions that they're you know asking their own minds to handle you know when they're trying to perform so as you said kind of softening that and reducing it and even to the point where you know what maybe just leave the phone in the car <laughs> it's kind of a maybe a good start but uh, yeah it's been a real pleasure chatting with you and, and thanks so much for sharing your uh, your knowledge and expertise with us well it's been fun i've enjoyed it
Brilliant. Thanks very much, Mark. Cheers.